Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Second hour today is going to be Dan Tepfer and Farplay. We're really excited. There's a lot of people watching. There's a lot of people on the panel. Uh, so everyone's really excited about that. And also a quick reminder that at nine o'clock, right after this and after hours, our own David Paskin will be uh, talking about ECAM and, uh, and, and walking through that. We're doing labs. Uh, so we do David's here. Ken is... Um, uh, talking about web uh, development on Wednesdays at nine and L is talking about uh, um, Isadora on Thursdays. So stay tuned for those. And we've got, a, we also have, I think today we have a, a later one, an, an SRT lab as well with uh, at 10 o'clock with, um, with Guy Cochran. So let's get the, the labs are getting busy in after hours, just so you know. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Um, Bill, what do we have? It's uh, actually I think it's Mitch, today. Today. Mitch. Sorry about that. No sorry, problem. Mitch. Uh, Aaron Jen Corelli from Flagstaff, Arizona. When you send out kits for clients use, do you send a video computer monitor? If so, what do you send? Uh, we do. We do send out with our kits with the larger kits that we send out. We send out a Mac Mini with a monitor, um, and we're thinking about moving to a laptop just because it's easier to set up. Um, so it, the the mo the Mac Mini and the monitor turn into a little bit of a uh, an art project. <laughs> so, uh, so we've been thinking about moving it. The nice thing about the monitor is that of course you can put it anywhere. The Mac minis were inexpensive. Um, so there's, so a monitor plus a Mac mini is less expensive than a, a laptop. <laughs> so, uh, and, and more power. And so, so we, that's why we went kind of that direction. Um, we're kind of evaluating whether we're going to continue to do that or not, but that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Um, uh, I don't think we have a specific Dell monitors are typically what we use for these things. The only thing there, there's, there's basically three things that, that I worry about with a monitor, um, especially for kits and general in general is that number one is it's got, it uses a, a C13 power. <laughs> so C13 is a, is the IEC cable. It's the typical three prong that you would see with your computer or anything else. I won't buy a monitor that doesn't have that because it means that anywhere that I need to buy a, a, a cable, I can buy it and I don't have to figure out what wall wart or what power it needs or anything else. So I won't buy a monitor that doesn't have a C13. Obviously it needs to have an HDMI. That may seem like an odd thing, but we've bought, mon we have, people have ordered monitors in my company that didn't have a HDMI. Uh, it, it might have, you know, a variety of other things. And then um, finally, it needs to have a visa mount. So it needs to have four screws in the back. They can be 75 millimeter, 100 millimeter. Typically, they're 100 millimeter, um, but they got to have that so that I can mount the monitor. And so those are the my main objectives when I'm thinking about buying a monitor. Uh, next question. Michael Weber from Foxborough, Massachusetts. What are the best ways to protect equipment from electrical surges resulting from lightning strikes? A local church and adjacent performance theater sustained significant damage over the weekend. More details in production general. Thank you, Carl. So the Furmans have these, they're power conditioners. Be careful which ones there. So these are actually ones that actually have voltage. They're usually around $1,500. Um, take a look. I think the 1800 is the current one, the P1800. So what these are, these aren't like um, frequency, EM, you know, these aren't frequency regulators. What these actually are, they actually have a, an air gap, essentially. They will cause an air gap. They have a relay in there. It's an overvoltage relay. So I think for the North American market, if once it goes over 140 volts, it'll create an air gap via relay. So this is the best way to actually do it. They are, you know, they're around $1,000 secondhand, $1,500. I would suggest buying a brand new because I think once lightning goes through this, you have to replace it or replace half the components on the inside, so you may as well replace it. But that is the best way. Um, there's much larger systems, which I know they use for concerts. So concerts that are outdoors, they can actually be a bit of a lightning. They, these, they have $5,000 versions that they use for the concerts. They have like $5,000 versions for each kind of circuit they're running. But yeah, so it's about $1,500. Um, I think the P1800 is the current model, but they do change that model every couple of years. They just update it. Go ahead, Jason. Nothing to add. That's a pretty good answer. A Furman and a UPS are, are pretty much your only and best defenses. Go ahead, Bill. And Carl mentioned air gap. The simplest air gap is to literally remove the plug from the wall and move it 10 inches away. If you're not during the show, if you're pre or post and lightning is coming by the area, pull your plugs and make sure there's no chance. Go ahead, Peter. I'm going to go back to what Carl said earlier is, you know, because he's talking about, at least he's referencing a church. I in my home have one of those devices that Carl said that, and yes, you do have to replace it if you've had a nearby lightning strike. I had, I had, I have, it turns out the transformer for my three or four houses on the block 
is right behind me. And I had lightning strike the transformer. And trust me, um, I actually had to pull the fire extinguisher out to go hit that relay because it it not only did it pop like it was supposed to, but it got really hot. <laughs> go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Courtney. And remember, if it's a direct lightning strike uh, and not, you know, several transformers away, um, lightning can jump three or four inches at high volt, the voltage that lightning's at. So a, a relay is not going to help you there. Good grounding, because uh, most relays, except for big bull switches, you know, which would have to separate it by five or six inches. That'd be a very big relay. Um, uh, make sure you have good grounding. Ground stake driven to the ground and make sure your equipment is grounded to a solid ground with uh, a good ground conductor. That's the best way to protect it uh, against the unknown. And churches have steeples and they should have lightning arresters on top of those steeples with large diameter ca cable that runs to ground to avert that from getting into the electrical system. You go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, and uh, lightning can come in other ways too, not just to power, it can come in through your internet connection. And like uh, Courtney says, lightning will jump and anything that, uh, that hasn't been protected could jump and then end up coming in from an unexpected location. Next question. James Babbitt from San Diego wants to know when a presenter is wearing a face mask, which mics and mic placements have you used for the most natural sounding recordings? Go ahead, Carl. So I've been involved with a few medical conferences. So this is 100% doctors all doing presenting. They wear face masks until they get to the lectern. They take the face mask off. They, they do their speech, they, they present, and they put their face mask back on. So they know and we know that they're much more intelligible if they just take it off while they're by themselves at lectern and put it back on when they join the panel or go back to the audience. And uh, Mickey? If it is a sit-down environment uh, and in a relatively good uh, environment, a shotgun microphone or a hypercardioid uh, placed above or below uh, would give you the most natural sound. Um, uh, if that is not an option, a lavalier would give you a more natural sound. And when you say natural sound, I think if you see someone wearing a mask, you should hear someone wearing a mask. Of course, you can compensate a little bit with some EQ, give it a boost that's somewhere between 4 to 8K, depending on the voice. But uh, don't make it so apparent that you're trying to compensate. Uh, if, if you see something visually, you should also hear and feel it that way. Next question. Matteo Missouri from ANSI, France. Has anyone been playing with the Blackmagic Pockets Camera 6K G2? What lens is best when using it as a super webcam? Go ahead, Tom. Well, I have the version one of the Blackmagic camera, but they both take the Canon EF mount. And this lens on this camera is the 2470 F2.8L version two. Carl? So that's a lens that I'm currently using as well. But the other lens that I would suggest is the Sigma 18 to 35. 35 is going to be your sweet spot generally for the for your um, Super 35 sensor. So the 18 to 35, it goes down to 1.8. That's the reason why I say so if you want a bit more bokeh or you don't have enough depth, rather than the 2.8, and it will cost you about one quarter the amount of the, the, uh, the 2.8 from Canon. So yeah, the Sigma 18 to 35, 1.8. Bill? I have the 16 to 35 Canon L glass lens on my Blackmagic original, and at this distance, I find I keep it somewhere around uh, 22 millimeters, and that seems to work. So it's going to depend on how far back you mount the camera from your face to get the right uh, the right size and geometry. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jason. Uh, one more vote for the Canon EF 24 to 70 f 2.8 to um, ver version two USM. It's a beautiful lens. That's what we buy for all of our kits is the 24, the 24 to 70. Um, we find that we sit at about 35, as, as was mentioned earlier. So we want it to be nearer to the middle of the lens as opposed to one end or the other. But I do think that I agree with Carl. If you want that, that extra short depth of field, um, it can work. We just find that we don't go that short because then people lean in and out of focus. <laughs> Next question. Next question from Laura Thompson in Beaumont, Texas. Thinking about alt text, does the panel pay any attention to this when posting to social media, particularly when posting professionally? Go ahead, Jason. Absolutely. If you're posting, I'm going to answer the question first for a website. Absolutely for a website. And if you're going to do it for a website, you should also just work it into your workflow um, to just add it to metadata uh, pretty much anywhere. So the short answer is yes. Go ahead, Alex. Yes. Um, on Twitter, I do alt text for every single picture that I post. And uh, as Alex4D 
and also um, when I run the account for British film editors. And how do you um, add that? Uh, it's a when you actually upload the picture, you um, have this. A, you add description, and then you add, add up to a thousand characters. And um, when you search for, if you actually use um, handles there and hashtags, there is actually discoverable too. So it's a way of actually making your uh, content a little bit more discoverable. Nice. Um, I keep the text actually in on the Mac. I keep it in the info panel in comments. So I can always, if I use an old picture, I can copy the old text from there and then just paste it in when I post the picture onto uh, Twitter. That's great. Uh, David? And especially on a website, if you're using images as buttons or navigation um, for accessibility purposes, that alt text is the only way that people with visual impairments will be able to navigate your website. Let's go to the next question. Next question from Matteo Mazzari from ANSI, France. Having to take some equipment to an event in China, two cameras, an A10 Mini Extreme, mics, couple of MacBooks, total value less than $30,000 US. What should I pay attention to? Customs and other advice. Thanks. Go ahead, Mickey. The, uh, China is a uh, carnet country, so I would highly suggest uh, applying for a carnet essentially fill out a document with each uh, item that you're bringing along with their value and serial numbers. This would allow you to uh, take the, the same equipment on that list out of China and back home. Um, and on, on top of that, I, I would also uh, suggest that hand carry uh, the equipment that will allow you to get to hit the floor, hit the ground running. Uh, you don't know, something may happen to your check luggage, so having just enough in your hand carry to start uh, a production at least rolling just a bit uh, would really be uh, really be helpful if something happens to your baggage. Good, Courtney. Yeah, good, good uh, advice, Nikki. Keep your uh, essential equipment in hand carry if you can, and travel with a carnet, as he said. Uh, make a list of all your equipment that you're putting in the cases with the uh, manufacturer the price and the serial number for each item that's in there. Then if it gets lost and you have to do an insurance claim with the airlines, you have the cost and everything else. But be careful because if you don't have an international carnet and you're traveling to some countries and you, let's say, you put a price of your camera in there at $100,000 and it's not you know new, it might cost that much, but yours is used or old, um, they may charge you import duty on the basis of that uh, price listed. And so you will have to pay an import duty on that, which they will keep until you leave the country with that equipment. And if you somehow get you know, tied up at the airport and can't get your money back, it may be difficult to recover that money that you had to put down as a deposit in cash when you go into a country that doesn't uh, have uh, imports for that particular device. Yeah, a couple other things when you're, if you're gonna use a carnet, I mean, into a company, country like China, <clears throat> we would usually use some kind of uh, freight company that, that manages all of that for us. So we use a company called Rocket, which is not the least expensive way to do it, but it they solve everything and it just shows up where you need it to show up and you don't have to think about that anymore. Uh, if you're going to do it yourself, um, one thing that I would re recommend is if you're going to bring a bunch of cases, you want to have a list of what what is in each case. So what Courtney listed, you have to put in the carnet. You also want to have another list of saying, these are in case one, these are in case two, these are in case three. You don't typically want to put <clears throat> what's in the cases on the cases, uh, unless it's in a code. You don't want to say there are cameras in here because that that makes them more of a target. So we have codes that we put on them. A lot of our cases have um, things that you can write on, little scribble pads on the on, right under the handle that you can just write on them. Um, but we write co it, write it in code, <laughs> not in not in uh, actual areas. But but the main thing is, is the, the cases have numbers, and we know what's in each one. What happens if you do this a lot? is customs gets used to you and they see that you're highly organized and highly processed. And they may ask you to use, look at one thing, but once, once you're a regular at, at customs <clears throat> and you're super organized and everything is exactly where it should be, uh, they tend to just let you through because <laughs> so, it's just like, it's, it's just an, one extra thing for them to deal with. Uh, next, next question. James Fosslead from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Cases for transporting the equipment can be transformed to the tables it sits on. Is there a best manufacturer for this use or a way to custom build them? Go ahead, Carl. So I'll speak to the people on the, uh, the south side of the equator. So Gig Gear in Australia, they make these. They're, they're kind of custom-made. So these are the ones on their website. They'll say they'll, they've 
they're, you know, make essentially just buy them off the shelf, but you can actually say, hey, I want a 22. I want a, you know, I want a 14. This is a 16 um, with a, uh, a top console with a 10U top console as well. But they'll make them to order. They'll charge a little bit more than the ones, you know, but yeah. But they're in North America, um, Gator don't make these as far as I'm aware. Gator don't make the tabletop ones, but there are other manufacturers, I believe, in North America that do. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, in North America, I would uh, use um, A and J cases. Uh, they make all the cases for Panavision and A and S cases, and they make a lot of cases for road cases for uh, musicians, traveling musicians, and so on. And they will custom make uh, uh, those. Sorry, those type of plywood uh, laminate with ABS or fiberglass uh, plastic on the outside. They're quite heavy. They're designed for shipping or for trucking. Um, if you're going to be putting things on a plane, they would might be a little too heavy unless you own the plane. Uh, and they will custom build. I've gone and had them build all the custom cases for my prompting equipment, which I designed myself. Sometimes it takes them two or three times to get it right, but uh, eventually <laughs> they do. And if you don't have right angles on the cases, it really confuses them. I had a case that had an angular lid that opened up that the back back side of the lid was three inches tall and the front side of the lid was six inches tall. Yeah. And they couldn't figure that out. It took them four <laughs> tries. The um, uh, I think we've used all cases in the in the past for ours, um, but same kind of thing where you you basically work out with them what you want as far as and we put in everything from you know cabinets and shelving and as well as all of our equipment and try to get it into it. Um, some one to think one thing to think about when you're having your cases done is if they're you t- tend to want to try to we k- tend to keep our cases at lower than 52 inches. I'm not sure exactly what that is in metric, but lower than 52 inches because if you try to ship that. Um, over with an uh, in aircraft, it gets more expensive when it's taller. I think it's technically 55 inches, but we do 52 to be safe. Um, when you go over that, it can double the cost because of the way that they have to pack it. So keep them, you know, we, we've we learned to do more shorter than uh, tall ones, which we started with because tall is really nice when you have a truck. Uh, so that's another thing. If you want to build your own, uh, the thing you want to research is what's called a shop bot. ShopBot is basically a router, uh, a wood router that will um, cut up to four by eight foot um, pieces of wood. So basically you just drop something in, you'd buy at Home Depot and you have a design for your case. This is how the, the companies that work with us, that's the case, that's what they use there. <laughs> so it's a it's $20,000 piece of equipment, but, um, but it will print, basically print all the pieces that you need. Um, you know, or, or route all the pieces that you need. And then all you need is uh, mechanical things. You can do things really intricate. A lot of cases that come out that are custom like that will have very intricate corners because they're avoiding putting any metal there. And then they just wood glue it together. And it's a very, uh, very tight connection. So that's another thing you can look at. Go ahead, Courtney. Sorry, mute's not working. Here's another tip, uh, casket latches. Uh, for making cases, in our cases, that would uh, latch, you know, the lid would come out and then it would flip over and and attach to the top of the case. So uh, you have to figure out some way latches to hold those cases together once they're latched together. Well, most other, most of the key turn type cases that have the strap that pulls down when you rotate a key, um, those won't work because then they're hanging loose all the time and you you have to have some way to retain them. We found that casket latches, which have a rotating cam that comes up out of the case and locks into a mating piece uh, are great because once they're retracted, they're completely uh, low profile. They're flush with the case and uh, those are a great thing. That's great. That's great. Next question. Ken Zolson from Sandpoint, Idaho. What are people, where do people go for tracks for testing speakers? Go ahead, Jason. Oh man, great question. Um, I've got three. Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, JS Box, Takata and Fugue in D minor, and the brass section in Paul Simon's Call Me Out from Graceland. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, uh, Alex. Um, as I'm a, setting up uh, student discos in the 1980s, it's Slave to the Rhythm by uh, Grace Jones. <laughs> got lots of stereo, huge amount of range. It's about all you can do with a CD format because it was produced by Sherman Horn. But of course, it's also useful if you're checking out mono because it goes uh, making sure the mono is correct because obviously lots of events, you actually do lots of stuff in mono really um, because it goes very much to the left and right. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. Uh, I usually just fire up a, a project that I'm currently working on or worked on recently because it's fresh in my mind how... Um, uh, it has sounded in my usual monitors. 
Uh, so I, I can have a direct comparison there. Aside from that, there are a few local bands that uh, I, I am very accustomed to how they sound. And um, also tracks from Fleetwood Mac and Steely Dan are also um, good references for me because I've been listening to them uh, through my dad since I was a kid. Go ahead, Mitchell. Donald Fagan, IGY, and as Mickey said, any Steely Dan. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Courtney. The soundtrack from A Clockwork Orange by Walter Carlos, now Wendy Carlos, because um, it's got synth stuff that goes really, really low and really, really high. And Beethoven's Night was great. I use uh, Holst the Planets, specifically Jupiter, um, and, uh, and then also Rush's Tom Sawyer. Um, because uh, the new, the, especially the new one, because it just really exercises everything um, that I that I need to to figure it out. Next question. Jens Olsen back again with a question. Has anyone tried the Sony HTA9 sound speakers? How do they compare to sound bars or full surround speakers? Go ahead, Carl. So these are pretty much everyone that's tested them a state of the art. I've only seen them once in an environment that wasn't perfect, but I have played with them. Um, I kindly got my own Sony system at the moment, so I was looking at these maybe to replace it, but the, my system is kind of as good as these in a way, but mine's a little bit different. Um, as far as what you want, as far as um, how they set up and kind of what they are, um, so this is banana for scale. They're huge. These speakers are huge. So these are like twice the height of an AirPod. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, not the AirPod, the, um, the HomePods. Home, home pods, yeah. yeah, the HomePods. These are HomePod OGs. So twice as big. They're humongous. So they're not tiny. Um, but as far as what they can do, everyone who's tested them in a good environment says this is a game changer as far as this kind of setup. Um, because you can put the four speakers in certain locations and because of the, you know, it's 2000, the $2,000 isn't necessarily speakers, $2,000 would be the, the R&D Sony put into this system. So this is their flagship system right now. Um, and that says a lot for someone who owns Sony Pictures. And, and this is, so it's basically, it's spatial. It's doing this, the same kind of thing that a lot of sound bars or the HomePod does, except it's four speakers. They are going to play out a bunch of stuff and figure out what, what's actually happening in the room and then figure out how to bounce things to sound. Like that's right. So each of the speakers actually has multiple speakers in it. So right. it gets kind of complicated when you actually open up one of them. But yeah, it's Sony's done a lot of um, R and D on this. You can tell. Very interesting. Uh, next question. V Pin Abraham from Pune, India, wants to know what is the cleanest way to get a bus out from an X thirty two to the A ten Mini Pro? Going through the camera would be difficult because of positioning. Go ahead, Carl. All right. So if you're going to go out, you're going to go out. Um, auxiliary out you know it's going to be trs balanced out so you want to go into a clean box so we've talked about these before so on the clean box you go in um via xlr so you come out of x32 and then on the back of this you'll notice there's a little 3.5 trs and that's what you do um i've just bought myself some 10 centimeter four inches four inch long trs cables um, for this kind of scenario, I've just bought myself a bunch of them off Amazon. So, yeah, so four inches is, I think, maybe a little bit longer than four inches, but I think maybe one foot. So let's try something like 12 inches to be realistic. Um, but, yeah, you want to keep that as short as possible. So this will live right behind your A10 Mini, essentially, and you can run as long cables as you want from your X32 into this. Go ahead, Mickey. Um, just to add to what Carl mentioned, uh, you can go out of one of the balanced XLR outputs. Not You're not tied into the... Uh, the the quarter inch outputs for that uh, an alternative to the Art Clean Box Pro would be the radial GI so radial engineering very solid reliable products that you can drop and kick and will still work um, <laughs> and um, though looking at your question if you are able to get an, a video out of your camera I think you can run balanced all the way to your camera think about it <laughs> You can also do things, you know, uh, uh, remember that for long runs as well, if you're, if you are running a cable, if it's not wireless or whatever that you're doing, but if you're running a cable to the camera, um, also uh, you could theoretically run Ethernet and just do an uh, Avio, you know, to the, in the last, the last little bit, you know, going into it so that, so that you, uh, so you just run Ethernet that way, that way you're not running, trying to run any kind of audio a long distance, which I, I, I tend to avoid even when it's balanced. Uh, next question. And it's from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. Daria and panel, what type of exercise or experimentation leads to an artist finding their own voice? Any telltale signs of the trap of trying to imitate, impersonate popular styles, artists, or personas that may go beyond influence to mimicry? Go ahead, Daria. 
Yeah, I love this question. Um, this is an awesome concept. Uh, my suggestion would be to look at the stuff you love, but then instead of just mimicking and trying to get their sound, analyze what it is that you're loving about it. And this is something that took me a while to do. So you, you look at, for example, a singer, are they doing something with their vocals, with their melody writing, like big interval jumps, for example, like when I loved Joni Mitchell or Dave Matthews or Sting, lots of big interval jumps. Look at maybe the scales they're using, definitely learn about the modes. This is my favorite thing in music theory of all time. Uh, I discovered over time that the Lydian mode kind of sounds like me to me. And when I improvise in that mode, it sort of sounds like my soul and my heart. So you find these little things that they're doing, but then explore those music theory concepts on your own. And then you'll start to find stuff that is you. Rhythms, chord progressions, all that kind of stuff. Just dig into it and, and start having fun on your own. Yeah. That's great. Uh, for our producers, uh, we've got a big and very, very knowledgeable panel and we're cutting through the questions very quickly. So um, so if you've got questions about audio or about any, any part of media virtual production, this is a great uh, morning to ask it. All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the next question. Brian Shan from Sydney, Australia. How would you independently adjust the audio levels of apps on a Mac using a MIDI controller? Go ahead, John. Um, using a MIDI controller. I read this wrong, so I defer to Mickey. Magic Mickey. Go ahead, Mickey. Uh, I don't know if this is a softball question from Mr. Shan, but uh, he actually recommended this to me or uh, mentioned this app to me, Ground Control Caster. Um, it allows you, it's kind of like loopback, um, but with MIDI control. Uh, I just, I bought it based on his <laughs> posting it and I've been just starting to play with it. I haven't tied the, the MIDI in, but it looks like a fun little app that so, so far. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, and loopback itself can do this. So you can have MIDI control loopback. So that's other one. There you go. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so, but interesting. Okay, yeah. Okay. So the audio out from each, so in loopback, you can have the audio out from each software and then you can, uh, that particular audio out, you can apply to a MIDI control. Very cool. I, I will say that I, I do like the interface on Caster. I think that for me, I kind of felt like, well, look back, I kind of like seeing all the cables and being able to figure out what I'm doing, but I could definitely see why someone would want to use Caster, you know, just because it just is a nice open interface as well. So I'm kind of playing with uh Playing with it. Now go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, question for Carl. Where can you do MIDI control on loopback? So loopback can have in so any VSTs, so in, in the mix. So it's simply the way the way you come in with loopback, it's I've watched a video on it. I've never had needed to use it, but I've watched a video on it. Right. Um, and so you can actually assign um, any That's slider, not, any any slider in loopback, you can assign a MIDI control. There's just not that many sliders in loopback. I think it, it would it be is is it in is, and it's not in audio hijack? That, that maybe, would be the case. maybe you need both running. I think you might need audio hijack. Yeah, I think you and I don't even both know. running. And and I don't know. Yeah, I don't know of any MIDI integration there. So um it's be interesting. But yeah, I uh, again I, I we'll have to do some more research on that. But I know that the caster stuff looks cool and I and I haven't we'd have to do some research on the MIDI MIDI integration there. Yeah. Um next question. Alex Forty Golner from London, UK. Wall Street Journal and Video Corp said second quarter sales would fall well short of its forecast amid a drop in gaming revenue in recent weeks. The latest sign that the pandemic era boom for computer chips is waning. Comments? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, I think it may reflect also kind of a, a fallout in the cryptocurrency market, which. Uh, uh, about 80% of all those chips being produced by NVIDIA were going into cryptocurrency mining. And uh, gamers couldn't even buy them when they needed them. And now that there have been several crashes in the cryptocurrency market and, and losses and hacks and things like that, um, it's become less popular and they're not predicting as many sales going into that market as such so that they, uh, their total, uh, total production then can now go into the gaming market and there may not be as much demand as there was previously. So it's would precipitate a drop. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Um, it's also partially due to the fact that you're right, they they admit, the NVIDIA admit that they can't really predict um, the use of cryptocurrencies for their, for their hardware. Um, so they don't know that this is interesting that three weeks ago, they four weeks ago, they kind of were predicting, um, let's see, I'll look at the figures, uh, that there were going to be, uh, there was going to be $8.1 billion for the quarter. And now it's $6.7 billion. I and mean, that's quite a big difference. And also that the margin, their margin is up till now has been 65% 
margin and it's going down to 40, 43%. So it means a big glut in chips, which uh, I imagine will be good for lots of people who want to use chips for different things as well as for them. Um, but good news for TSMC, who actually make their chips because they, they're they able to smooth over the kind of boom bust process, but it's all the other people that use TSMC that are going to have problems in the next few weeks. But obviously that might be good news for people who rely on Blackmagic's um, stuff as well. Go ahead, Bill. I wonder also if the trend that Apple kind of pioneered with the M1s of integrating all the GPUs and CPUs on a same, same very large scale integrated chip is going to make it make discrete GPU as a goal less and less as that advances farther and farther because they're on the same die and it, that's the fastest connection. It might, but there is so much based on NVIDIA that I think it would be very difficult. Most of the gaming is really written to the card. You know, it's not... I mean, they, you know, or take full advantage of it. NVIDIA's approach to GPUs is far superior than most of the other approaches. Uh, as someone who we used to rely heavily on the cards, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the NVIDIA card from a production perspective is very superior to the, to the AMD card or what used to be the ATI card um, because it would, the, the AMD card will chunk it into much smaller pieces and makes it very difficult to, to, to do higher order calculations. And so... The um, so I think that Nvidia is probably you know they, they may I think it, this is mostly crypto and it's mostly because the crypto crashed and no one has money to um, you know it, it, the the ROI is much lower you know you could just kind of throw things you know throw hardware at stuff with the, at forty thousand dollars for Bitcoin at 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 a, at a half that it's it's a, it's not they're still making profit my understanding is is it's uh, it costs about twelve thousand dollars per. Uh, Bitcoin. And so as long as it stays over that, um, people are still making profit, but it's a lot. The uh, the profit margins are much shorter and you can't just kind of throw more hardware at things and just print money, which is what people have been doing. The people who have been doing it have been printing money by just throwing hardware at it. And I think that's, that's slowing down. Next question. Next question in from Daria Musk on planet Earth. Has anyone on the panel used the Sony FX3? I'm comfortable with the Sony mirrorless lineup and looking to upgrade to a real cinema camera that's simple and small. I go ahead, Mitchell. Well, I'm glad you asked because this is an FX3 you're looking at right now. And I bought it mainly because it's the entry level to the Sony Cineline. And um, it isn't exactly small, but I can show you what it looks like uh, in captivity. Uh, here it is. Uh, going to aim it correctly. Uh, the handle on the top is the audio adapter, and it's a very secure handle because it comes in with those two screws that you see there. Um, the body is small, compact, and easy to use. Uh, that is a 17 to 70 uh, Sony G Master lens on the top there. Uh, it's, it's not, again, it's not super small, but it's very, very uh, typical of Sony cameras, particularly in the Cine line. Uh, I'm using what's called S-Cinetone to make my face look brilliant, uh, and it would make yours look absolutely beautiful. Go ahead, Carl. So if so, if you're in, if you've got Sony glass, then the FX3 probably would be a good one. Um, another two that you may want to think of that will still be similar price range and easy to use would be uh, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, which is a 4K and a 6K, which a lot of people on the panel have as well. Um, and the other one would be the Canon R5C. So this is a cinema version of the R5. Um, Alex can speak to their 180 lens that they have for it as well, which is pretty cool. Um, but that camera is going to have a lot of features coming as well that are just not out yet even as well, but that's around five and a half, uh, four and a half grand. Yeah, the, the, the R, one of the things cool about the R5 is, it, is what Carl was mentioning is you can get a dual 180, so you can do literally a stereo 180 capture from the R5. And I, I keep on floating around wanting to use it, but I haven't, haven't pulled the trigger on it because it's really expensive. Um, but, uh, I, you know, the, thing, the main thing is, is, is to look at whether you have an ATEM. And in my opinion, if you have an ATEM, I would, I would get a, a black magic camera because you can shade it, <laughs> you know, you can now, you know, and, uh, it's just, um, you can play with it. And, and if you have, if you start adding more cameras, all of them are shadable and all of them are controllable and all of them are, you know, and, and when you get used to that, it's really hard. I mean, I just find it to be painfully inefficient to have a camera that I can't shade. Um, go ahead, Mitchell. I just, I forgot one little thing. Uh, it does have the famous Sony autofocus, yeah. which works so well. And you don't have to worry about focusing anymore once you have that. 
Yeah, and, and that is the one, that's the big advantage of using the Sony is the autofocus. Um, but but if if you are gonna be relatively stationary or someone's gonna do that, if you wanna move around a lot, that is something to, to look at. Um, next question. Matt Cool from Montreal, Canada. Have you ever lost money on a show? Sometimes things change after the quote is submitted that are out of your control. How do you keep this from happening? Go ahead, John. This is what lawyers are for. I, I recommend that you watch uh, yesterday's show. Bill went over this. Bill's got a line item on the bottom of his quote that says anything outside of the scope. We have the same clause on the bottom of ours. Anything outside of the scope that's been signed off on has to be has to be billed. And so that's how you that's how you save yourself in that regard. Watch yesterday's show. Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Uh, ever lost money on a show? Yeah, definitely. There are a lot of projects that the uh, and uh, the value that we as I or we as a company receive is not monetary. There's some 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 projects that uh, you do it because you want the, the you like the story, but they don't have a budget, or you do it because. Uh, you you want to learn from from it it's a learning experience um in terms of the usual shows uh, the usual projects wherein you're you're meant to earn an income um that's where uh yes having a a detailed uh, scope of work would come uh, would come into play and when it exceeds uh when the um the requirements exceed that scope of work if things change then that's when you talk to your client and say like this is what this new requirement or new deliverable costs. And having a good production department, good producer, good production managers, good post producers, um, uh, keep track of that. You go ahead, Bill. Uh, everything both John and Mickey said, um, for the two words, well, the two phrases that I keep in mind always scope creep because they always creep up. And the other thing is up to, and my contracts are written to, I will provide up to three cameras. I will provide up to three days of shooting. I will provide up to whatever else. As they hit those limits of the up to, you are absolutely proper to say, you said three cameras, now you've asked for four. That it changes the scope of this work and I have to recalculate for you. Never had a pushback on that. So make sure you write your agreements carefully. You go ahead, David. I've been losing money on this show for the past two years every time someone suggests that <laughs> I need a new piece of gear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, what well, would double your pay? Yeah, that, that, hopefully that'll make up for it. Yeah, the, um, uh, you know, I, I, I do, I do think that, uh, Riders are also really important. Uh, telling not only what you're going to provide, but what you require. Um, so, on especially on a larger show, um, saying that you know, like I am really specific about my space. <laughs> like you know, so if we have a big show. I'll be like, I need a box that is exactly this size that is unencumbered by anything else. You know, and I need this much load in time. I need this much power. I need this much internet. I need this much, you know, like, and, and I need things to be delivered to me at a certain time. And I need, you know, and these are all, this is usually pages of, these are all the requirements. And if any of those requirements aren't met, we may increase the price of the, of the event because um, it'll put pressure on, it means that we have to pull over time or we don't, you know, we have to figure out how to do that. Um, so, so riders, as well as what you're going to provide is the, is the quote, but the rider that goes with it, which is what you require to execute that event. Um, Cause usually you're not the only, uh, in cases where you're not the only team, everybody else has to provide what they need to do on, in a timely fashion. Go ahead, uh, Mitchell. All great advice. And uh, one small thing, I get emotionally involved sometimes with light items, things that we're doing that are different or fun or might get noticed by uh, the powers that be. Uh, don't get that way because uh, when it comes time to edit the, uh, uh, the list, uh, it's always the thing that you really want the most that has to go. So don't get emotionally involved. I get emotionally involved all the time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm usually, uh, I, I will say that I've, almost every job I've lost money on was a job that was worth doing. Like we wanted to do it. We were excited about what we had in front of us. And we, you know, uh, we just leaned into it. Like, and, and, and generally those have been, um, again, they have made more money than almost any other projects because we put our heart and soul into it. We lost money on it. We use it all the time as an example when we're having meetings. <laughs> you know, like this is, there's a, there's a concert we did with Lincoln Park that, you know, we lost probably, we lost, we lost a lot of money on that job. And, um, and the, uh, but it was right before Chester passed. It was in their, in their original studio. And I use that as an example of concerts 
all the time, <laughs> like almost every week, you know, and because it's my favorite that we've done, you know, and, um, and so it was, uh, but it was, it was worth every penny. Uh, next question. From Douglas Carmichael, Rocket Lab, the U.S. New Zealand rocket company, famously uses Logitech gaming headsets for control room communications. Wouldn't most gaming products and especially their software not have the reliability for life critical comms? I go ahead, uh, Carl. So they're not necessarily using the software that comes with them. Um, so essentially, they're, they're just picking the headset that works for them. So they're actually quite good, the, the higher end ones, the Logitechs. So these have inline um, volume, inline mute, and they, they are three and a half um, mic and a three and a half um, headphone, but it also they also all come with a USB input as well. So they actually come with a USB. So these Logitech G ones and the G are for the gaming ones. These aren't the basic telephone ones. Um, they're actually good quality. That they're you know they're as good as probably the Sony's you know that are around hundred dollars. So as far as their drivers for the the headphones um, and essentially the company would just go they'll just audition maybe six or seven and they'll go yeah these ones and they can just have a whole box of these on the side if one breaks they just go replace it it's how cheap they are go ahead Courtney uh, yeah what Carl said <clears throat> they're analog headsets so they don't really use any software at all as long as the impedance matches the input to their comm system it should work fine and if they're advertising the fact that they're famously using Logitech gaming headsets it's probably product placement they're probably being provided by free from Logitech Maybe even with with extra support. <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I was going to say the other thing I would point out that um, having gone through this a few years ago for a different different with a different company, the uh, Rocket Labs is not man rated, so there is no life involved. Um, yeah. So so the reality is is the headsets are good enough for what they need to do. As as Courtney and Carl said, they're they're analog headsets. Uh, and they can be quickly replaced, as I think Carl said, there's a box on the side with a bunch of replacements. Um, it's only when things, uh, both ground station and the rocket itself, have to be man-rated man when they carry uh, human life. And, so. and sometimes it's, it's just easier to have things that are disposable. There's a, uh, some friends of mine work at a at a facility that does really, really, really complex calculations um, with thousands of processors to fig, you know, to calculate things that that are life and death, and um, they learned to not make powerful processors. What they did, they had the cheapest processors they could find, and they just have lots of them. And they, a, a certain number of them, fail every day. Like, and they just literally, it was just cheaper to. They just pull them out. They, they build them into things that literally slide in all all of their stuff. There's no wiring. You just slide. You pull one out and slide the next one in. And I mean, now when I say there's a certain number of them failing every day, uh, 15 years ago when I was talking to them about this, there was, you know, 3,000 processors <laughs> so that, that were there doing the calculations. And so they were just pulling them out and, sl and, sh and slugging new ones in. But someone just does that all the time when they fail. And it was much cheaper than trying to maintain more expensive machines um, than, than do it, to, to do it that way. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael asked, how do you specify a specific data type, integer, for example, for a parameter of an Isadora actor. Oh, I think you, 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 you we would need a, a Isadora expert, which we don't have today. Um, but I would highly recommend taking that question to Thursdays. Uh, Thursdays with L. L will definitely be able to answer that question for you. Um, so there's labs at nine o'clock on Thursday morning. Um, it's a, I'm just gonna take advantage of the opportunity here to tell you that it's a great uh, lab with L, and L will walk you through. Um, you know, a lot of, he usually has a project and he's talking about stuff, but he just answer questions. And so, um, so I would, I would bring that up to L on Thursday. Next question. Alex 4D Golner from London, UK. When Apple introduces the more M2 based Macs and iPad pros, there is an opportunity for faster IO than Thunderbolt three or four. What improvements are likely? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, the, uh, the device with the fastest IO at the moment that Apple make is the Apple TV 4K which has got HDMI 2.1, which has got a few more little, few more gigabits than uh, Thunderbolt 3 slash 4. Um, so to some extent, um, Thunderbolt 3 and 4 is exposing a PCI bus, exposing the pins on an Intel chip, uh, which is the metaphor. So what about uh, what can be on, what can Apple Silicon be connected to and what faster connector can we have? Or would just be HDMI 2.1 be a nice thing to have on a, a new, the new Mac Pro or the new MacBook Pros? And go ahead, Carl. Well, yeah, so the HDMI 2.1 being at 48 gigabits per second, it is streaming in one direction only, and it's not packets. 
So that's another thing altogether. Whereas the South Bridge, we're talking South Bridge here. So the South Bridge of an M2, they still has a South Bridge. You know, it's just on the actual chip itself. Um, the South Bridge has to be compliant to industry standards. So hardware work with it. And this is Thunderbolt. So Intel and Apple developed Thunderbolt way back in the day. Um, and, you know, Apple still is on that, you know, on, comes to those meetings and makes sure that stuff gets done. That's where Thunderbolt 4 comes in. Um, but yeah, Thunderbolt 4 being at 40, but the thing is you can have multiple controllers. So if you want to actually link two together, you could get 80 coming in, but no one's really got hardware to do that because no one actually needs hardware to do that because it's, you know, we just bring data in. So there's not much out there, like even like, you know, 12G for SDI is 12G for SDI. When you get up to 8K, yeah, you might bond four of them together and get up to 48. Um, but even then when you're going up to 48, G4, 8K, 60 in SDI world, it's there'll be a PCI card that'll be able to handle that. So the PCI card can go, I think, four times at the moment, four times faster than Thunderbolt can. Go ahead, John. So Intel leaked a, a uh, document on Thunderbolt 5, uh, inspected out at 80 gigs. So expect to see Thunderbolt 5, 2023, 2024 timeframe. Go ahead, Jason. I don't think there's going to be anything, at least for the next generation of MacBooks, but um, the hub protocol really hasn't been played with. Um, that really is is kind of the the trick of Thunderbolt 4. And, you know, 40 gigabits per second um, full duplex symmetrical is, is pretty stinking fast. Good luck. Uh, good luck exhausting that. Next question. Eric Antonio from Washington, D.C. To get surround out of a Mac studio for production and consuming, is it as simple as an audio interface with enough output channels plus powered speakers, or are there more requirements? Go ahead, Mickey. Um, in most situations, yes. Uh, you can get surround audio out of a Macintosh. Uh, just uh, having a, a multi-channel audio interface and also the... Uh, appropriate monitors for the format you want to monitor in. Um, for consuming, uh, you can play back uh, un, uh, unencoded uh, PCM wave uh, directly, or if you if the material, material you want to play out is encoded in uh, some sort of, uh, say, Dolby-based uh, codec or DTS-based um, codec, you'd need to have a player that can decode that. Um, there'll be no issue with Apple, but some D flavors of DTS and Sony uh, flavors also need special players to do that. Um, but the ideal setup, though, is aside from having the multi-channel audio interface and the speakers, you would also have a speaker processor so that you can time align and also EQ your system specific to that format that you're monitoring and Aside from that, also a monitor controller, so you can calibrate the levels of your speakers, uh, control the level the levels of all speakers using a single knob, and also be able to listen to the um, stereo fold down or re-render uh, at the push of, of a button, and also, of course, be able to monitor in mono because you want to check everything in mono. I got it, Carl. Yeah. So just adding to what Mickey said, as far as consumption, you will need a receiver. So there's no way to oh, do Mickey it. Doesn't, Mickey so, doesn't think so. <laughs> off, so. So if you're if you're doing something from Netflix and it's Dolby Vision and Dolby, you know Dolby Atmos in Netflix, and you're going out of the computer, you just go out via HDMI. So you just go out via HDMI. So this is for consumption. There's no way to get Netflix decoded inside the Mac. Well, to will Atmos Netflix to, from a Mac actually not on a computer, not on a browser. It, it's only stereo yeah. via the browser. Yeah. So okay, let's say Apple. Okay, let's say Apple TV then. So. Apple, well, the TV Apple TV, you need, a, you need a receiver. No, yeah. Apple TV Plus. So Apple TV Plus via, you know, Macintosh. So if you're doing, like, let's say, out, then you can just go out there by HDMI. So the HDMI stream will carry mm. the Atmos before it yeah, gets encoded. So you'll need a... The problem is, as Mickey said, you'd have so many different flavors of surround that if you have to have different software, um, that would be the issue. And if you just had a receiver, if you just had, like, a $500 receiver, on top of, like, because... Production versus consumption are two separate things. As Mickey said, you're going to have a very different flavor for production where you're going to have time alignment with your speakers mm -hmm. and your monitors and all that. That's, that's one way. But for consumption, it's quite simple. You just put an HDMI cable out of your Mac into a receiver, into passive speakers in this case. So, But you can use something like the Monolith from Monoprice and do it going out to your active speakers. So you can go out to active speakers as well if you wish. That's a $5,000 solution. But there are ways, but it's much simpler to just go out of the HDMI 
of a Mac Mini or Mac Studio and just go straight to a receiver. Yeah. And, and to your point, there's a couple of companies that make something like the monolith, and that that is the way we've pulled tracks, you know, from from uh, from from stuff is to is to basically with the monolith, what Carl's talking about, we'll do 16 individual XLR outs based on the you know, so it, it'll decode into the 16 channels, and uh, at that point you can record those 16 channels if you want to, um, and we've done that for. I mean, for production, you know, like we need it. We don't haven't done it for consumption, um, but but it is something that's uh, interesting there. Go ahead, Jason. I could swear I've done this with um, little more than a Duo Two and Loopback. Am, am I just completely no. for like? Am I just yeah. getting yeah. it wrong? Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, with Apple TV on macOS, you are able to play out uh, five Dolby Digital or Dolby Digital Plus and five one or higher. Um, as long as you have your audio interface configured with an audio MIDI setup uh, to uh, to recognize a 5171 or higher uh, um, speaker configuration. There you go. Um, and we're going to talk about surround once a month. So so we'll keep on talking about it. maybe setting up your system for surround might be a good uh, subject for us to spend uh, a, a second hour on. Uh, next question. Chris Comfort from New York, New York. I was looking at the Movo Edge DI wireless lav system with a lightning connection for a friend making videos with his iPhone. Does anyone have experience with it and know if it's a quality product? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Mickey. I don't really have an ex uh, have experience with it. Uh, I'd say buy once, cry once. But the real reason why I raised my hand is that it's uh, Chris Comfort, and we miss you, Chris. Hi. <laughs> Mickey's here, Chris. Mickey's here, and you're not, Chris. <laughs> come, 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 join us. Yeah, I, I don't, I haven't, haven't used the Mobo. Um, uh, next question. Next question from James Haldane from Vancouver, Canada, looking for a way to connect phones to PA. Uh, radio makes Bluetooth DI boxes, but they also make a USB mobile tablet and smartphone DI. Pros and cons, and there's a big link there to it. Go ahead, Courtney. I don't know about that particular box, but the uh, Rodecaster Pro 2 does have a Bluetooth interface for bringing phones in, and it's quite handy uh, to uh, deliver mix minus to the phone as well and um, bring it into your, to your mix. So that's one solution. JK Audio also has a variety of phone interface boxes, yeah. which you can JK. use Bluetooth and direct into a mixer that works fine. I think JK Audio has just about every way that you can get a phone in and out of an <laughs> in and out of a production system. Uh, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, so the Flow 8 can do this as well. So the Flow will bring your phone in. It will send it out via USB or out via XLR or out via TRS or out by you know there's any way because the Flow 8 can go out in, in many ways. But yeah, the Flow 8 can bring in one a single Bluetooth device. Yeah, no Mitchell. Angry Audio, they have a Bluetooth device that uh, will talk to your phone every possible way. And because it's a broadcast, it understands the fold back and uh, mix minus capabilities. And they have a cool logo. Oh, there's that. And a cool name. I, we have to get them on. I, we, I did talk to him about that. And then I think he had something coming up. So we'll, we'll, we'll reach out again. Uh, Jason? Yeah, Alex won me over on this one. I have never had an easier phone patch in my life than the than the Audinate Bluetooth adapter. It's so easy and it sounds terrific. Yeah, no, they're, they're, it's like a little pill that does does the thing. All right, next question. Jacob Goodnight from Indianapolis, Indiana. Is a Sony ZV-E10 paired with a Sigma lens a good choice for high-quality webcam use? Looking for cameras in between a Brio and a Blackmagic 6K Pro price point. Go ahead, David. So I am a fan of the Sony cameras. Right now you're looking at a Sony a6400 with a Sigma uh, 1.4 lens. Um, and the ZV-E10 is sort of a quarter step above uh, the 6400, even though the price point is a little lower. Um, it's more recent and um, it's it's got a couple other bells and whistles and uh, the 6400 isn't available. Go ahead, Mitchell. Love that camera. The ZV-E10 uh, is my go-to camera. I pick it up. I put a, um, a big uh, Sony powered uh, zoom on it uh, 16 to 35. It's a G master. Um, also the, uh, the small rig, uh, cage is a good addition to it. And I had the, uh, audio adapter on the top, but I dropped the camera and broke it off. So, <laughs> you know, and it still works. So there's something uh, right there. That's great. Uh, next question. 
Next question from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Ran into an odd one. What would you consider the max ideal height for light stands? Ran into a situation with a 70-inch doors in a historic building. I've never felt so tall. Uh, go ahead, Carl. So C stands, let's say from Matthews, they have a, a 40 inch center column when they're collapsed and then you know, maybe 10 inches on the actual base itself, on the feet itself. So if you get a turtle base, you can take the feet off, of course. Um, so generally the light stands will be maybe 50 inches, you know, when they're folded down for the larger ones. And of course you can get the 20 inch versions of the C stands. Um, so I have, I have many light stands myself, of course. And I think the longest one I've, I've got is like maybe a meter 10, which would be a four, about three and a half feet. So three and a half feet is, is like the longest I've got folded down. Once you get into the room, of course, you know, I've got one that goes up to 25 feet, 24 and a half feet, something like that. So they do go very high, but collapse down, they're usually um, three, you know, four feet maximum for some of the really big ones and usually 90 centimeters, so three feet for the moderate sized ones. Okay, Bill. Thankfully, we're having lighting equipment that is based on LEDs rather than the old tungsten. So things are getting lighter up at the top of a tall stand. I used to carry one Manfrotto stand that was 17 and a half feet. And I can't tell you the number of times I pulled that out to solve real production problems. Often it was to put a mic up at a ceiling in a ballroom speaker just as a tertiary. If everything else fails, if the audience can hear it, I will get a sound back to my camera and save the day if everything else fails. And that happened to me once. Uh, but small light uh, carrying at least one or two stands that can go very high i think is a really good production thing however high you can handle go jason yeah with caster wheels I, I'm, I'm with carl maybe four and a half feet tops um and then as far as max height is concerned i don't know sky's the limit courtney uh yeah and and the grip world are called high rollers uh they're typically, you know, here's one from Kubo that's about 330 bucks. It's a 14 footer and it gets down low enough to be about less than five feet tall. So you can go through normal human sized doors with them and they have retractable legs with casters on them. And these are used a lot of time for doing uh, goal posts or uh, arrangements where you're running a, a pole that's going to support lights that go on either side of the person of your talent. So it gets it up above the top of the frame and doesn't get the stands in the shot. And definitely something that we pay attention to is for almost everything we buy is what will it take to disassemble it? So that, you know, there have been places where we just had to either hike it up somewhere, we had to move it up somewhere, a um, uh, variety of different things. And so making sure that you have the tools that are required, if it's not just done by hand, uh, some C stands, as Carl mentioned, you can just do it by hand. You can take the, the base off or whatever, but other ones you might need an Allen wrench or, or something else that's going to go in there. And, you know, either having a full set of tools with you or having the tools that are required to take apart that piece of equipment um, oftentimes can help you get through some uh, tight, doesn't look like you would need it for this, but that's how we've gotten it through. Sometimes we we had one place where we had about a 10 inch gap and a door and we're going to get everything through that 10 inch gap <laughs> like for a variety of reasons. And, uh, and so it was, it was, uh, and, and so getting it through there, it was a little bit, actually might've been a little bit higher because I know that we had to squeeze through it as well, which was very painful. Um, and to, to shoot and, uh, everything got disassembled and slowly worked through and then built back up on the inside. And then, uh, we had our thinner crew, um, squeeze through the, through there to operate, operate stuff that was down there. And, uh, I, I didn't fit. <laughs> so, so I, I got to, I got to sit outside. So anyway, so, um, so anyway, so that was, uh, it was, so you knowing how to disassemble things, uh, is, and reassemble them is useful. Go ahead, Bill. Also, low and narrow are the two things you often run into in trying to do load-ins and things like that. So in terms of a stand height, sometimes you will see this is a three-stage stand, a four-stage stand, a five-stage stand. It's how many sections. The more stages, usually, the lower the stand will go to get through small spaces at the same height, max height. Uh, less ones you know, normally don't have them collapse as far down. And the leg spread is right. also very important. If you have anything rigged on a light and you've got a big spread stand, trying to get it through even regular 36 inch doors can be a real nightmare. Yeah, yeah, next question, we're gonna go real quick. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh, PA. What do you use for the network connection to your ATAM? Any best practices to ensure reliable use? Go ahead, Mickey. Sorry, just rereading the question. What do you use the network connection to your ATEM for? Oh, I use it for control. I have no connection in the USB port of the ATEM minis in our facility. Uh, we're we're using the HDMI out into a different capture card. So we're using the network uh, port for control. Go ahead, Doug Carl. 
uh, for ATEMs that I don't own but I do use. Um, yeah, control from a panel. So this would be like a 1A, uh, 1ME switcher or a, um, the color switcher. Yeah, we use it also for VPN. Um, so we have it there and we were able to attach it, you know, and, and gain control of it from anywhere in the world, you know, using a VPN. Next question. James Babbitt in San Diego, is a link needed to join the Final Cut Pro walkthrough with Bill Davis on Friday? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. No. Uh, well, actually, yes. Uh, if you have After Hours, you have Bill on Friday. And I'm a uh, regular Premiere user, but uh, I've watched Bill do an excellent job of walking you through uh, uh, Final Cut. Almost makes me want to use it. Go ahead, Bill. Well, yeah, we're doing it. Uh, we did it in the main room the first two times. They now have us in a breakout room, so just anybody can show up and knows how to get to after hours. Please stop by. We're just trying to give you an overview of what the capabilities of the software are. All right. And 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 uh, what time again? We do it at noon, noon Fridays, noon okay, Pacific. Um, and uh, uh, and that's in after hours, right? So we're doing. Are we doing a breakout room for that? Yes, we didn't the first two times. We did it in the main room, but the last the last uh, session we did as a breakout room, and so Great. it should be that going forward. That's what I've been told. And you're gonna do it every Friday. Every Friday until people stop wanting me to show up. And I think what I'm going to do is I've got six modules planned. We're at number three as of this week. I'm probably going to go back and redo one and two because there weren't a lot of people. And there seem to be more and more people showing up. So we'll, we'll get that into the schedule as well. If you're, you're going to do it every Friday. Sounds great. All right. We are now changing subjects here. And I am going to hand this off. We're not changing subjects here. Uh, go ahead, Todd. Todd Todd was, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, <laughs> I, I kid, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can. Excellent. No, I'm just trying to trying to work uh, work Dan and Dan coming back into Zoom. We're dealing with t today. We're actually dealing with two parallel audio and video systems. So it's far more complicated than yeah. than even I was even imagining. But uh, Dan was was uh, was there. I think he went back to the green room. He'll he'll come right back in just a minute. But uh, while okay. we're waiting for him, uh, he wasn't hearing anything from Zoom. Got oh, it. you are. You're there, Dan. Okay, I just don't see your video on Zoom. Can we hear Dan? You might, you want to be on stage. There we go. There we go. Can you all hear Dan? Unmute yourself, Dan, and we'll uh, see if we can hear you. Hi, everybody. Yeah. We're here. Thanks for having me. It's so great to have you back, Dan. We're really excited. I'm super psyched to be here. Yeah, this was so fun last time, and uh, thanks for having me back. Now, I know you that, that you and Todd have been kind of figuring this out about how you're going to do what you're going to show here. So can you tell us a little bit about what's new? And then I'm going to let you guys kind of run it a little bit because I think that I don't want to get in the middle of the machinery here that, that you've built up. Yeah, so, so last time I was here, which was, uh, I can't remember exactly, but a number of months ago, uh, I showed you Farplay, which is this app that I've been working super hard on since the big, well, basically since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it's an, an app that enables you to play music with others through the internet and not with any kind of trickery, not with any like shared metronome or anything like that, but literally just by minimizing the latency between participants so much that it's actually low enough to play music together, uh, as you'll see. And the thing is with the version that I showed you back then, um, was that it was uh, only one-to-one. -one. So you could only have duets on it. And it also didn't have its own video. So in order to use it, typically you would, you would open up Farplay and then next to it, you would open up Zoom or, or some other video solution and just have it on mute. And you'd kind of deal with the two things together. And with this version, we, we just released this version, which is version 1.0. It's our first version that's officially out of beta. And uh, it has built-in video and it has multi-user support. Uh, so you see we're going to be playing uh, with, with four different musicians in four different locations. And um, it also has a bunch of other features that I'm going to look forward to, to, to telling you more about later, especially because I know a lot of you are real audio nerds here. Uh, it's got multi-track recording and uh, multi, um, multi-channel broadcast output, which is something I can tell you about, about later. That's awesome. That's awesome. So how many people, what's the maximum number of people that can now join? So there's no official limit. Uh, it's all peer to peer. So it's going to depend completely on, on your network bandwidth. Yep. And, uh, and I think that because, by the way, Todd, I think that you're coming through Dan's thing, just so you know that I think we're hearing your... Are we getting a yeah, bounce? Think, Todd, ideally you would just leave audio on Zoom. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, um, but anyway, so the... Uh, uh, 
so so it doesn't it's just a matter of if people have fast enough connections you can just keep adding because it's all peer to peer it's peer to peer for each one of them is that how that works yeah there, there's a there's a future version of this program where we will do like smart hubs where like maybe the person who has the most bandwidth will actually aggregate aggregate some of the bandwidth some of the data from the other participants and send it out in one stream right but uh that's for that would add road. No, that would it would add, well it depends on the geographical location so if we have precise geographic location for the participants we could actually do that in a in a smart way uh -huh. um choosing the best point but that's that's you know a, a future endeavor at this point and uh for right now it's all strictly peer-to-peer -peer. everybody's sending their data to everybody else which is going to be awesome. the, lo the lowest possible latency obviously yeah absolutely and what's the maximum distance you know for that so I've done this, I actually, on June 21st, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but it's, it's officially Make Music Day, this international uh, celebration of everybody in the streets making music. It originated in France. I did duets with people all over the world. Uh, I was in Paris at the time. I did duets, I mean, not, sorry, I'm, I said duets, but not duets. It was more than duets. I played with uh, two musicians, at, uh, so, so a trio with musicians in Australia. Uh, I played a duet with a bassist in Japan. I played a bunch of, of yeah. larger and it, things. It, does it kind of Europe. depend on the style of what you're doing? Well, totally, because like if, you, if you're playing between Paris and Australia, just by the, by the nature of the speed of yeah. light alone, which is like yeah. never going to be, um, right. you're never going to be able to fix that. Uh, you're going to get a certain amount of latency, like between uh, New York and Australia, you're going to get probably 100, 150 milliseconds or like at least 120 between New York yeah. and Japan. It's 80 milliseconds. That's really right. like as low as it gets. When you're getting those kinds of latencies, these are way lower than anything you would ever experience on zoom, even if you're in the same city. Right. But, um, it is noticeable for music unless you're playing like something relatively right. slow or maybe like a little floaty. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, once you're within, you know, like coast to coast in America, uh, San Francisco to New York, there's something I've done a whole bunch. There you're getting like 40 milliseconds, right. which works with a lot of styles of music. You're not gonna be able to play like a super fast unison bebop line. You're not gonna be able to go like, you know, in unison, but you're gonna be able to play, I would say like most musical styles. And then when you're within like a thousand miles is when it starts to be like you're exactly in the same room. And within 500 miles, it's like becomes unnoticeable. Because we have to remember that, I mean, the rule of thumb, it's a little, it's not perfectly accurate, but you lose about a millisecond a foot. I mean, that's how we think about it, even though it's more like 0.8 or whatever, but, but the, uh, but about, about a millisecond. about in air. And in the air, like just, just, yeah. so if someone's, if someone is 20 feet away from you in a studio, they are 20, you know, about 16 milliseconds from, from you, um, you know, so you're already, when you talk about that, you're already kind of getting into that mode, right? Exactly. We're, we're totally used to playing 20 feet away from somebody in air. Like that's right. not a crazy mm -hmm. thing to do. And that's going to be 20 milliseconds of latency. We yeah. actually have a little Easter egg in our app where you can click on the latency slider and you can put it in feet <laughs> and you'll see that you'll see that feet, feet are almost the same as milliseconds. It's like a tiny bit more like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like tw 20 milliseconds is 22 feet. Right, right, right. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Um, the, uh, so I think that you, uh, you're going to try something here. Is that, is that the next plan? We're going to play, play you. And, and Todd, I think we're hearing you through Dan yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so, um, so the, um, so I think you can leave, you probably leave yours off and we'll probably see it. Yeah, but just leave zoom audio and then be in business. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And then, um, uh, all right, well, I'm going to let you guys show us how this works. Awesome. Uh, so, all right, there we go. If, if I'm hearing, see, I can't hear Dan now. So let me get, no, no, I'm going to turn zoom audio off. Back. And then you, were you able to hear Dan before? <clears throat> there we go. I'm back. Yeah. Todd, I think the best is, is if you just stay on the far play side. Oh, I'm on the far play side now. Oh, I, uh, awesome. I left but, zoom audio completely. So sorry about that. Oh God. Okay. So, so yeah, you can still hear him because you're hearing him through me. Got it. Perfect. I, like, no, I actually can't hear them. I, I can I, only I, hear you. No, I know. I, I was talking to the global. Oh, I got to you. The <laughs> hour global this is going to be crazy. To so me. I'm just going to say very quick few words about what we're going to do here. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can really see exactly what's going on. So all you're going to see is, um, is far play. You're going to see the far play video window. And why don't I just do that right now? Okay, so can everybody see that all right? So you should see yep. 
uh, a four top here with, um, in the upper right, we've got Todd Reynolds, whom you know well. So he's both still on Zoom. This is the craziest thing we're doing here, where we're like, you know, doing far play and Zoom at the same time. But he's, he's both on Zoom and in our far play meeting. And we also have uh, two of my favorite musicians, old friends of mine, great jazz musicians from New York. We've got Noah Preminger, uh, who is actually located uh, in, um, uh, in Massachusetts right now. And we have Massimo Bilcati, a uh, wonderful bassist. And also, by the way, kind of internet famous because he's the developer of iReal Pro, which many of you probably know. It's like every single musician has that app. And uh, Massimo is located in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And I'm in Brooklyn on Prospect Park. Uh, Todd is in North Adams. Uh, so we're, we're all on the East Coast, but like pretty solid geographical spread here. And, um, and we're all with latencies that you can see here. Um, you can see here, this is our audio window in Farplay. And on the right here, I have a mixer and you can see individual latencies for each person. So Todd here, he's the farthest from me. The latency between us about, is about 20 milliseconds. Um, between Massimo and me, it's six milliseconds. So we're just like golden. It's like, he, he's literally like right at the end of my piano. Uh, and then Noah, who's also a little further, that's 13 milliseconds. And we have very, very accurate measurements of these latencies. It's one of the things that we worked really hard on in this app. So, you know, as we were just mentioning, this is like playing together in a room with the furthest person being 20 feet away from you. So we are able to play highly rhythmic music. Like you could play any style of music here. And we're going to try to demonstrate that for you now with um, an old jazz standard. This is uh, called Cherokee.
<laughs> That's amazing. Amazing. You know, and it just, it, it, it helps. It helps. Oh, thank just, you. Thank unbelievable. You. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Now, what's crazy about this is I can't hear office hours at all. So I've got to do some, I think I'll just I, I think pull my audio. What, what we'll do right now is say, is say big thank you and goodbye to, uh, to Noah and Massimo. Uh, unless you, you want to hear more, but I, I think, I think we have lots to talk about, right? More. <laughs> if you want to play, if you want to, if more. you want to, if you want to, yeah. We just got another 10 minutes. Yeah, we're, we're fine with playing yeah. something else. If you've got something else to play. We're, we're, else, got something else to play. We'll, Do we have to we're, light lighters to get you to yeah, stay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're, we've, we've got a bunch of questions, but, but we'd love to hear more. I mean, this is amazing. It's such a I treat. mean, we might as well. Like it's, it's, You're all here. this is one of the, this is what I love about doing this is that it's just yeah. so fun. Like yesterday, we got together to, to just like set this up, which just took a second. And then we just ended up playing just for fun yeah. just for like a long time. So, so that's the thing. It's just, it's like, that's the whole idea with Farplay is to just encourage people to make more real authentic music together. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take, uh, what should we, what should we play guys? Um, okay. around midnight. Yeah. I, mean, I, I might, I might have to pull up a chart for that, but you know what? I'll use, I, I'll use I real pro do, to do uh, it. Um, all the things you are like we did yesterday. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. With straight eights. Yeah. Cool. Oh, um, kid Dan, it, uh, Mickey's asking us if we could put, uh, if we could put the video in full screen. He's asking. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. And then we can do all things you are. Yeah. Great. Is that better? Mickey. Say yes for me. I want to show off just for a second that uh, I've designed different layout possibilities here. So you can do oh, a whole great. bunch of different layouts and uh, you can also inset your video if you want. So that it's got my video in the upper right uh, and still rotate all around. So that's awesome. All right, guys. Um, Massimo, you want to bring us in? Sure.
so great there we go i just want to say a huge uh congratulations and thank you to to noah preminger fantastic saxophonist who's playing with us today he's even he's sick today actually he's like nauseous <laughs> and still playing and um, that's you when you're sick oh my god yeah you should hear him when he's when he's when he's healthy <laughs> um no i mean just beautiful and and, and massimo biocati you know two of my favorite musicians and just really appreciate them joining us this morning so early. This is not jazz hours, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Could have no, fooled absolutely. us. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> amazing work. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I guess we'll, we'll return to, to the Zoom now. To Zoom, yeah, yeah. yeah. Say, say, say goodnight to the, to the far play. No, and Massimo, such a, such a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. So, so great. We'll go back to Zoom. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and so, and, and what was amazing is, is just that it, it just, your, uh, it was just seamless, you know, like there wasn't any, you know, there wasn't, uh, you, you really felt like everyone was just playing, you're just, play, you're jamming with each other and it doesn't, it didn't feel like there was any kind of, you know, uncomfortableness or, or anything else. It just, it just worked, you know, so and the sync and these are all consumer, man. these are all, these are all, uh, consumer connections. You know, these aren't, yeah. you know, fiber or, you know. Well, uh, f full disclosure, I have a really good fiber connection. Um, mm -hmm. Massimo also has a good fiber connection. Right. And um, I can't remember. I think Noah has. Todd does I'm not. not sure. Todd does not. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually. We all know that. <laughs> Todd, is, Todd is really the, 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 the test case here because he's right. kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And he doesn't have fiber and he doesn't have crazy bandwidth. What's your upload speed? Is it 40 megabits per I, second? I can, get 30, I can get 39 on a, on a good day, but we are in an internet desert. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah so, so, so the fact that Todd is, is able to do this with his connection uh, is right. really the test here. Because uh, yeah. no, you, you actually, you know, fiber makes everything better, but you actually don't need it. Yeah. You know, you're not going to do this on like a 800 kilobit connection. Right, right, but, right. Uh, but you are going to do it on a, you know, I, I've tested it with upload, C, upload speeds as slow as like eight megabit per second for duo, yep. for duos. That should be fine. Dan, can just congratulations on your achievement to hear no articulate an idea, pass it off to Dan. And then, uh, it, it was just amazing to be able to hear real time collaboration of ideas between musicians across the internet. And then Todd picked up on that and carry it farther. I mean, that's just mind blowing. Great, great job. Yeah. You know, th thanks for noticing that, because to me, that's that's everything that I love about music. It's, it's yeah. because music has the potential to give us this sense of true brotherhood and intimacy. You know, it's, it's music has the, the power to bring us together. And I think you need to be able to go back and forth in that way to feel that if you're just like sending tracks to each other or even just playing to like some kind of sync metronome. To me, it's like it loses everything that I love about music. Yeah. It's really, and, and it does help to have master musicians all playing yeah. together, you know, like it, 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 like as an example, it's like, if we're going to show you how this works, this definitely, that makes a difference. But I'll tell you um, what, the latency is even more forgiving if you're not a master musician. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> something right. I, this is something I noticed, you know, I, I have a few students who are yeah. like far away from me yeah, and I've noticed that like, yeah, 45 milliseconds of latency literally is they can't even feel it it's like it's like when you're skiing you know you, when you first start it doesn't matter what skis you're on after exactly. a while it starts the, the the scratches start to bother you <laughs> so exactly yeah, yeah so yeah. <laughs> uh, let's let's go ahead. we've got a ton of questions so we're just going to start throwing them at you uh let's go to the first Beautiful. question 
Thanks, guys. Uh, first question in from David Brady in New York, New York. Licensing question for the teacher music school where they need more than 45 minutes of free. Would students need to have licenses or are they umbrellaed in under the host's license? Asking for a friend, Matt. So only the person creating the session, it's actually the same model as Zoom. Only the person creating the session needs to have a subscription. Uh, so if you're a teacher with students, you can have a subscription. Your students don't even need to have an account with us. They can just uh, join. We've made it, we really wanna make this as easy as it possibly can be. Next question. Next question in from JHB in New York. What is the limit to the number of participants in a far play session? So as I was mentioning earlier, there's no official limit, uh, but it is gonna depend on your bandwidth. And it is, we're still working on the efficiency of uh, video in particular. Uh, I'm sure those of you here who know, you know more about Zoom and all of that know that video, real time video compression is a very taxing on processors and in particular when it's hot like it is today. So that's gonna be a, a limiting factor as well. Like for now, I don't think you can expect to have 20 people. We actually have not pushed this yet. I haven't seen how many you can have, uh, but, but for sure, you know, up to seven, and eight, uh, seven or eight is, uh, should, be, should be cool in most situations. Next question. David Brady, New York, New York. My Sunday place is home to a Tyco group, a drum ensemble. Is latency low enough not to cause issues in predominantly percussive rhythmic applications? Yeah, so the music that we were just playing is basically very highly rhythmic music, especially that first tune. Uh, and and I, don't know, I don't know if you noticed, but we actually purposely had Massimo, the basses, drop out at some time so that we're just playing lines together, we're playing counterpoint. And when you're doing that, it's extremely demanding on the latency. So any situation in which you can do that, you'll be able to play uh, type of drums uh, or, or any form of percussion. I've done this with drummers, uh, it's not a problem. On the other hand, you know, it is obviously going to depend on geography. If you, if you have a taiko drummer in Japan and another in, in New York, that's not going to work just, just from the nature of the speed of light. You know, you know, you're on the outer edge when you're, when you're limited by the speed of light. <laughs> yeah. you know, no, I mean, I, I truly believe that we are doing this as, as fast as it ever can be yeah. done. Like yeah. the only thing that could improve it would be uh, faster internet Quantum connections, points. which which I guess there is a way of getting fiber to be faster because it's not actually speed of light fiber. It's what is it like a third of the speed of light or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so maybe there are improvements that, that can be done there, but at some level you're just up against it, yeah. against physics. Yeah. Next question. Daria Moscow is here on the panel. How is far play and handling tight, faster tempo playing together as opposed to legato jams? Yeah, I mean, I, I just addressed that. Uh, it's really, really excellent. If you're within like a thousand miles, but even, I mean, I, I've played pretty tight tempo stuff, even um, cross coast. You're not gonna be able to do like prog rock, uh, San Francisco to New York, but you should try actually. You might, be, you might be really surprised. I've been really surprised. You get like 40 milliseconds of latency can be surprisingly workable. And then within a thousand miles, uh, you, you can definitely do super tight tempos. Uh, you'll, you'll be very surprised. And a lot of these questions came in before we even started talking. So, so sure, I think sure. that we may cover them. Uh, uh, next question. James Babbitt in San Diego, California. Farplay allows high quality audio at low latency and your music has a powerful effect. What do you do in a music therapy session with Farplay? You know, I really think this is a great application for Farplay. Um, we're just, you know, as I mentioned, we're literally just out of beta uh, now. This is version 1.0. So we're just starting to get the word out in, in, in a serious way. And I really hope music therapists try it. I think um, if there's a limitation for music therapy, it's simply that both parties need to have a computer. We're not on, on, uh, on mobile yet because low latency audio on mobile is, is, you know, has some challenges, although the new mobile devices are able to handle it a lot better than they used to be. So that's definitely gonna be in the future. But so for now, uh, your client in music therapy is gonna need to have a computer. And, um, and what it's gonna enable you to do is something that I take it as very important in music therapy. It's gonna be to actually make music with your client through the internet, you know, um, your, your, your client has their favorite song, they wanna sing with you, you're on guitar, they're actually gonna be able to sing with you. Uh, and, and for that type of interaction, latency is quite forgiving actually. So like, you know, even if you're in a situation where you got 50 or 60 milliseconds of latency, you're gonna to totally be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm really looking forward to hearing from people on, on how that goes. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, what is the highest latency you've seen jamming possible between two users of Farplay? I mean, that's just gonna completely depend on the style of music. So for instance, uh, for people who are curious, that 
uh, epic marathon uh, I did on, on June 21st, I mentioned earlier, where I played with people all over the world. It's on YouTube. It's on my channel, uh, YouTube. Uh, it's Dan Tepfer Music is the name of my channel. And um, you will see that, for example, with the bassist who was in Japan, we had 80 milliseconds of latency and we're playing like free improvisation. It's a lot less rhythmic what we're doing, but it's still like super fun. This is a dear friend of mine who's an amazing musician. We had that experience of really making music together. So, the, the, we are authentically jamming together. It's just you're not going to be able to do what we just did here where we're all on the East Coast. Next question. John Preto here in the panel and in Las Vegas, Nevada. Does Farplay only work if you wear a black t shirt? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> that helps. That helps. Yeah. It makes everything a little faster. <laughs> did you want to add anything, Todd, to that? The, the, I was just the gonna efficiency say of black shirts? You know, it's. It's version 1.0. You know, we're still working stuff out. Dan is still working stuff out. So working on the green t-shirts, you know, I mean, we uh, tried it yesterday and it horribly broke. I was wearing a red shirt and it was done. It was just, <laughs> it's it the, absorbs the, extra the, the light. Video, and gets the the video light. compression has hard, a hard time with the brighter colors. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, uh, next question. Scott Mueller in Germantown, New York. Is there a way for a remote audio engineer to take control over the mix with effects and EQ? Yeah, um, actually, that's a little bit what I'm doing here, except that I'm not remote. But uh, one, one of th there's a lot of features behind the scenes here at, at Farplay that I'm actually super proud of, and that were that are completely unique to us. So, for instance, you might wonder why I didn't hear the audio that was going out to the stream, but I assume that it was pretty much glitch free, right? Um, yeah. may, if yeah. there were any glitches, I think they're probably no, extremely was, occasional. So we were actually hearing some glitches in our headphones, and that's because um, with Farplay, I like to say that you get your cake and eat it too, because we have this thing called broadcast output. So basically we allow you to have the lowest latency possible in your cans. And basically that's up to you. You can adjust that latency slider so that you get the right compromise between audio glitches, which are going to happen. It's in inevitable because of the nature of the internet and just like mm -hmm. packets don't arrive quite in time or audio quality. And it's for you to decide. Like personally, I've gotten pretty comfortable with, with some glitches and I'd rather have a lower latency and a little, a few more glitches, but obviously the audience doesn't want to hear that, right? That's forbidden for audiences. And this is an idea I had really early in the pandemic. It's like, well, the right. audience doesn't need to have it in low latency. We can decode that stream a lot later with a much higher buffer. And with Farplay, we allow you to send that broadcast output, which is this higher buffer decoding, uh, to another audio device. So in this case, I'm sending multi-channel audio from Farplay without the glitches to Reaper, and I'm doing a live mix there. But you could be somewhere else. You could just join the session as an audio engineer without contributing audio, right? Uh, in fact, you can just do no audio in your choice of audio device. And you can be pulling in all those audio streams and doing a live mix uh, and sending that out to, to, a, to a stream. Mm -hmm. Like I could be sending this out to, to OBS or... Uh, you know, as I am right now, sending it to, to Zoom. Or alternatively, one of the things that's like, what I just described, that's really kind of for advanced users, but we also have really state-of-the-art recording built in. So you just hit the record button and you can choose to record multi-track or mix. And if you record the multi-track, you just end up with this, uh, these perfectly synced stems that are also using that broadcast output um, buffering so that our, you know, they're gonna be glitch-free Right. And they're perfectly synced. That, that's not, not an easy thing to do to sync those two different buffers. So, yeah. Uh, and so, and so how yeah, much is, are, what's the buffer like for the second buffer, the, uh, the longer so buffer? You, so you can set it yourself. Uh, actually, for, for the recording, we, we, we use a set buffer of a whole second. Right. Because we might as well make it super long. Right. For the broadcast output, you can set it yourself. So right now I had it at 120 milliseconds. Hmm. That's just yeah. a number I kind of like. Yep decided on because, totally because I, I just from experience i know that you know adding about 100 milliseconds will cover almost any possible yeah. glitch including playing with somebody across the world yeah amazing uh, go ahead Todd. but you could set it for anything you wanted yeah it's great yeah, they, dan and i were having this this conversation this morning which i think is it's kind of important to bring up here i was remarking that with this low latency slider that we have I'm working at the lowest latency possible but the glitching that i'm getting in my own in my own monitoring is so much different than it was January 27th when we first did the first the, the far play. Thank you, John Preto. Um, and and it's much better. I, I experienced so few glitches, and this is even with my compromised internet. So right. um, it's kind of and what Dan responded to me with was, yeah, the thing that's always going to be changing here is the internet is always going to be getting better. Yeah, 
So that's yeah. And we I actually think. have made some improvements also in our buffering mechanism and in, in, uh, in, in the way that we negotiate very small glitches. We're actually like, we're actually filling those in and doing crossfades now, as opposed to, uh, to just like sending an empty packet. I so there are ways, tell me that. there are ways of massaging it a little bit. Cool. And, and are you, um, can you, can an artist send more than one track to each other? So right now you can only send stereo. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is two tracks. And, and so, you know, for example, if you're a singer songwriter, you know, you could have a mic on your voice and a mic on the guitar. Uh, and, and so you send two independent tracks that can then be mixed independently, right, right, uh, right. either in real time or later. And, and one nice feature we have is also, we have this thing called mono mix where you can, uh, choose to either send those two channels mixed to mono or receive those two channels in stereo, but then listen to them in mono, mix them to the, right. to the middle, which, cause it can be annoying to hear a voice in one ear and, and yep. guitar in the other. But, but yeah. we do plan, uh, we do plan to have, um, to extend it to multi-channel later. That's great. Uh, next question. Scott Mueller in Germantown, New York. I think playing jazz is a little looser than playing rock, for instance, where playing in a pocket is crucial. Will this work in a groove band setting? I mean, I completely reject that characterization. Um, I actually think it's the opposite. Yeah. It's, it's actually the opposite. Like if you're playing rock, typically first, first of all, the tempi are much slower than, than, than what we're doing. Like that first tune, um, you know, that we played Cherokee, playing dum, bum, bum, so it's, that's your quarter note. That'd be a pretty fast tempo for rock. And the thing is in rock, you're gonna feel it like on a half note. You can be like, doom, ba, doom. Ah, that's what you're feeling. So for us to be able to play uh, those contrapuntal lines together that we were playing, to be able to hear that accurately enough to not be like slowing down relative to each other, that's actually a super hardcore test of latency. And you're definitely going to be able to play, I think, any rock on the planet. I think the only thing that, that would that would test it would be like some really complicated odd meter prog rock, um, which which would be totally cool with a setup that we just had. You'd be able to play any style of music, but if you were cross country then that would test it. Next question. Courtney Gooden from Hollywood, California. We're hearing the far play session in mono and Zoom. Does it support stereo for each participant? I think we, we covered that. Um, well, hold on. Did, did you hear mono from me? Yes. Oh my God, really? That That's, means I forgot to turn original sound on, on, on Zoom. I was sending you beautiful stereo, believe it or not. <laughs> That's a real bummer, actually. I just forgot to hit the original sound button. Oh, you know why it was? It's because I hit it er er earlier and I had to hit it again when I came back to the meeting, right? Right. When I went from the yeah, breakout right. room to this room. Every time you join, you have to hit it again. I needed to hit that damn button and I forgot to hit it. No, no, we're, I'm sending you like killer studio sound and that's a bummer that you guys were hearing it in mono. It still sounded fabulous it in mono. Great, it was but, very but, yeah, high resolution. You know how much better stereo sound yeah, I guess, I, than yeah. mono. We're waiting for 5.1. We're waiting for 5.1. I, um, I apologize, you guys. That is really a bummer. I'm glad somebody pointed that out. No, yeah. you, if you heard this on a live stream, I've, I've done tons of live streams this way. Yeah. You would hear this literally full studio quality, uh, nice mix and stereo. And, and again, one of the things that we're starting to test is 5.1 on YouTube. And so, uh, you know, it'd be fun to take, have someone come in, grab onto all those tracks and, mix and, in spread, and spread them out. Um, totally. We'll talk to you about that because we, we might be able to do a special where we play with that or experiment with that, you know, in the not too distant future. There's one. Yeah, that we, with what we have right now, we, we could do that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, Todd might be able to experiment with that too. Uh, uh, next question. <laughs> Mike Potter from Hanover, Germany. Is the far play experience better and easier to get on a Mac system or on a Windows PC? That's a great question. Uh, so far play works on Linux, Windows, and Mac. Um, those of you who have worked with audio on these systems will know that audio just is more complicated on Windows. Uh, it's just a much less unified uh, back end there. And uh, in particular for low latency audio, it's um, it's just less straightforward than on Mac, but we've worked really hard on it and we used to require ASIO drivers and now we don't. Uh, you will get better latency with ASIO drivers, but you can actually just uh, download Farplay, use it right out of the box with a native Windows drivers and it actually works surprisingly well. Uh, you might get a few extra milliseconds of latency. It depends on your system. But in any case, the answer is yes, it's more straightforward on Mac, uh, but it's actually super straightforward on Windows as well at this point. Next question. 
Jesse Mills, San Francisco Bay Area. How far are the microphones from the piano for Dan's setup? My, I'm, I'm using um, a couple DPAs that are actually in the piano under the lid here. Um, I, I like doing it that way because it it's super foolproof. Uh, you know, if there's street noise or whatever, it doesn't really get into the mics. Uh, but so they're, they're very close and I'm mixing, I'm, I'm, at, I'm adding reverb, uh, which I can't believe you guys were hearing that in mono, but anyway, that's the way it was. <laughs> Next question. Daria Musk here on the panel. You guys sound incredible. Did you just set uh, your levels and go or is someone mixing you live? I set my levels ahead of time. So the way that I did it is I recorded us playing a little bit right before we, we went live. And then I listened back, did a mix in Reaper, uh, just literally adjusting compression and levels and, and EQ and, and reverb a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, setting compression uh, well enough, then you're going to get a, a live mix that's going to work well without having to adjust it. Of course, ideally, you'd have somebody, somebody adjusting it live, but, but no one was adjusting this. Next question. David Brady from New York, New York. Dan. How's the arm, elbow, shoulder, shoulder doing? Was your recuperation responsible for such dramatic advances since your last visit? That is so sweet to remember that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fully healed. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good. And I think, yeah, you know, sometimes getting sick or, or having an injury really makes you appreciate being healthy and makes you come back more productive. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Next question. Mark Breslow asked, how are the musicians keeping time with each other? It would be neat if Farplay had a metronome for each player that compensated for calculated latency. Right. So I love that somebody brought that up. So to me, that is not neat. To me, that's um, exactly what we're trying to not need in Farplay. Like to me, the magic of music, as I, as I mentioned it earlier, is this deep, deep, deep connection. And, you know, there are these, these experiment, these studies that have shown that people's mirror neurons are activated when they're playing music together. Um, and in, in particular, when they're playing rhythmic music together, and we get to experience this profound intimacy with each other in real time when playing music together. And I don't think it's the same when you've got a metronome going. Like the thing that makes you connect is listening to where the other person is placing the beat and playing with them. Uh, I think there are solutions out there that'll give you some kind of a metronome and they compensate for things, but that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you an authentic experience of playing together like you were in the same room. You go ahead, Todd. I think the the analogy is what we were kind of talking about. Uh, Dan mentioned this earlier. You know, we've been throwing tracks back to each other, musicians, all the time. And it's a, just a different type of experience, equally rewarding in some ways, because it's, you know, it's activating the mind, and but is not, the goal is connection. And, and with connection, connecting through an external source is, I don't know what the metaphor is there. There's some sort of ham radio metaphor there. I don't know. I, there's, there's, there's something in there that just doesn't, it kind of removes connection rather than stimulates it. Next question. David Brady is back. Could the latency used to the advantage in a composition, i.e. generative music a la Frippertronics, crank that latency up? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a very fair point. There are people out there in this low latency realm that just consider that latency is an interesting musical element and that you can make music with it. Uh, you know, there's definitely a lot to be done there. And one of the nice things that we do with, with Farplay now, that's actually, this is new, this is that we have a completely new approach to buffering now uh, that it's improved things in, in various ways. But one of the things that it allows you is to really set your latency specifically. So if you raise your latency slider, you could put it all the way up to um, 250 milliseconds, uh, or you could do it even more if you use the broadcast output. Um, so it certainly can be a compositional element if, if you want to go that route. You know, personally, I've spent way too much time in my life uh, getting to a point where I can play in, in hopefully passable time with other humans uh, to, 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 to really be that interested in that. I just want to feel that feeling of connection. I thought it was interesting. I was listening to something on NPR and they were talking about the fact that a lot of chants don't make sense unless you're actually in the cathedral that they were created in mm. because they, because they were built to, they were built for the reverb of that space and they don't sound the same if you don't hear that that build up that they were actually attempting to do or were doing in those spaces. It's really interesting. That's such an interesting point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia. How much does it cost? Yeah. So uh, we have a free version. And by the way, it's the same app. You know, you can just upgrade or downgrade your, your, your subscription at any time. 
So the free subscription allows for one-to-one -one sessions up to 45 minutes in length. And actually, you can have as many as you want. So if you want, you could uh, just make a new session uh, once you're 45 minutes in. Um, and then for six bucks a month with a free with a first month free, uh, you get uh, Farplay Standard, which uh, allows unlimited multi-user sessions. Uh, and again, only the person creating the session needs the subscription. Uh, the other people joining don't need the subscription at all. It also allows you to record uh, the mix of the audio. And then we have uh, Standard Plus, which is uh, eight bucks a month. And that uh, comes with all the bells and whistles that I'm using here. Uh, at this point, it's, it's, it's the highest tier we have. And uh, it, it allows multi-track multi recording and multi-channel broadcast output, these features that I mentioned earlier. It's amazing. Uh, next question. And, and by the way, that's, that's a lot cheaper than all then and then the other people that, that we know in this oh, space yeah. eight eight dollars a month for the whole just get the whole thing <laughs> eight dollars yeah. a month is nothing to, to, to do what you're doing i mean it's just amazing um, thank you yeah really really cool um next question david brady back are there any built-in methods to rtmp stream the session direct from farplay not yet but that's definitely on the list I, I, yeah i think you know to be able to rtmp the video and the audio directly to to uh you know to to a youtube uh, live stream or something like that i think would, would be pretty nice next question jesse mills san francisco could the video bit rate be reduced in order to increase the speed of audio transmission yeah so you can actually set your bit rate directly uh for this stream we had it all set at 300 kilobits per second so very low and the idea is to just absolutely put the the um the focus on the audio but you, if you know, if you have a high bandwidth, you, you could you could set that much higher if you wanted to. Next question, Tony Mobley, Noonan, Georgia. Would Farplay work with vocals? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, vocals are much more forgiving latency wise than, uh, for example, instruments like piano and guitar and drums and bass that have that very percussive transient um, when you know at the beginning of the note. So yeah, absolutely, vocals are great. In fact, we have uh, we have people using it. We have one user, at least one user, who uh, is a opera coach, and she lives in the middle of the woods in Canada, and she has Starlink. And I actually tried it with her. I was in New York. She was in Canada over Starlink, so the signal signal is going out to orbit and back down. Although it's a low orbit, they're only forty miles up, and it worked. We had like forty milliseconds of latency for opera. It was perfect, and uh, we played some Schubert. It was awesome. That's great. Uh, next question. Jason Pags in Nashville, Tennessee. As a player, is it easy to feel like you're in the pocket or groove timing-wise? Yeah, as long as your latency, like basically experiments have shown that people start to notice latency above 20 milliseconds. But that doesn't mean anything above 20 milliseconds is a deal breaker. I mean, like we had 20 milliseconds between Todd and me uh, today and it, I didn't feel it at all. I don't think Todd was feeling it at all. It felt totally natural. Um, so, you know, again, the analogy is with these, this distance in a room, if you're 20 feet away, you've got 20 milliseconds of latency, just in air. And if you're 30 feet away, you've got 30 milliseconds. So, um, so in other words, just use that analogy and just imagine playing some really high, highly rhythmic music with somebody 20 feet away from you. It's fine. You know, we do this all the time on stage. Next question. Jesse Mills. What's the audio sample rate and bit rate everyone's sending? Can it all be multi-tracked within the Farplay system? I'm not sure I completely understand the question, uh, but, but it is all multi-track and the, the, the bit rate and sample rate is 48 kilohertz, 16 bit. Uh, on our list is uh, being able to, to accept different sample rates. It's a little bit complicated because it means we have to resample either that or everybody has to agree on the same sample rate. So, so for now, we uh, just, have chosen what we think is the best compromise because almost every audio device on the planet can do 48 kilohertz yeah. and 48 kilohertz sounds better than 44 kilohertz and is worth that, that extra little bit of, bit of bandwidth. Uh, so 4816 is pr pretty great and it's all completely uncompressed uh, raw PCM. So you're getting studio quality sound. That's great. Uh, yeah. And I would agree 48 is, <laughs> I wouldn't work too hard on that. that that's not, that's not the, the highest feature set that I probably would think about. It's not about. a high priority because yeah, yeah. you don't really need to send 96 kilohertz yeah. sound through the internet, you know? No, no, you don't. Uh, next question. 
Douglas Carmichael asks, would you ever think of adding isolated output from FarPlay similar to Zoom ISO and our OSC control similar to Zoom OSC? And it sounds like you already have. I mean, so, this, I, I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, because you, you're, you're sending it out to Reaper right now. You could send that out to anything, right? It's just a device at that point. Yeah, yeah, you can send it to any audio device. And I'm using loopback to, as, a, as, a, as a pass-through device, but you could even use a Black Hole, which is a free alternative. There's a bunch of alternatives for passing audio from one app to another. And yes, one of the great things about Farplay, and I should make a, a fine point of this, is that we, we, you can use multiple devices sim simultaneously, and they're all perfectly synced. So like right now, uh, or what, when we were playing earlier, I'm sending, uh, I'm using my... I'm directly connected to my audio device hardware for my own monitoring because I want that latency to be as low as possible. But then I'm sending the broadcast output, which is, I guess, the equivalent of Zoom ISO, to a wholly separate audio device, which is this loopback audio device that's sending it to Reaper. Right. It's amazing. Now, next question. Douglas again. When a major university reopened their football stadium tailgating area, they said that attendees missed the interaction that the bands they booked had on stage with each other, not just with the crowd. Could Farplay replace that for that use case? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I did a ton of live streaming through the pandemic. I did a, a hundred live streams every Monday. And in addition to that, I did uh, probably a hundred more um, for presenters, you know, uh, when it was a Monday. Uh, so I think there is a lot of intimacy to be gained from playing on the internet. I mean, I, I've gotten to know my listeners really well just through comments. And, and in, a, in a way that like the closest you can get in live performance is a CD signing afterwards or something where you're, you yeah. know, people can ask questions, but it's, you're very pressed for time. So it's very different. So I think this is a really interesting realm that we're all figuring out. And I think there's a lot of potential for authentic connection through the Internet. Not that it replaces the real world, uh, but but it's not fake. There's there's right. deep connection to be made there. So and I think far play is a part of it. Yeah, and we 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 do that every day here. <laughs> so exactly. Pretty, I mean, you guys are amazing. Connected. Like, you, I'm sure you feel the same. You built a legitimate yeah. community here, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I feel more it, connected to the, this community than probably most of my physical community. So, so it's, it's an uh, amazing thing. So yeah, no, I'm definitely. Uh, and and we find times to to find each other when we go to physical events. <laughs> We're like, okay, who's in the community that I know? So mm -hmm. uh, so it's really interesting, Dan. Um, Thank you so much for your time and effort. This is just amazing, amazing software. Truly Thank incredible. Thank you so much. I, I mean, it, it, I can't tell you how much it means to me to present this to people who really get it. It's, it's, oh. not, it's not all the time. You spend a lot of time explaining basic concepts to people most of the time. And I think that it's, it's, it's rare for people who are creating software to really get it too. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that the fact that you're developing this and you know what you need, and, and we understand what that, those fine details are because, because but you're, that, the, the thing is, is a lot of times you have software developed, but it's someone who has a kind of a limited understanding of what they're writing into, and you're solving your own problem and really solving it from all the directions that we want to solve it as well. And, and that's why I think it's just such an elegant, piece of software so far. And anytime you have an update, especially if you're going to bring a band, um, you know, like, like we're a hundred percent behind you. So, so like, you know, anytime you want to come back, uh, we would love to, anytime we'd love to have you. Thanks, well, Dan. Thank you. I would love to come back. Thank you so much. Appreciate Jill. You. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks to our producers for all the great questions. Um, really kept the whole conversation moving forward. Thanks to the panelists. I oh, can't do this without you. And uh, thanks to the incredible team in the back end that is making all of this happen. There's, you know, every day there's a huge uh, village that, are, that, that rises up all over the world to produce this show. And uh, thanks to, to all of them for, for the hard work. All right. Uh, a reminder that uh, David Paskin's going to be talking about Ecamm uh, in, at 9. And then there's an SRT uh, lab at 10, all in after hours. And that's where we're going to go right now. Oh, that was great. That was incredible. So good. <laughs> Man, I, I got to tell you, Jason, I couldn't have done it without those Ray-Bans. Oh, you're welcome. Cool panelist of the day award. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Dan. Um, I, I, if I may, you know, one thing I just wanted to say is I just want to say huge, thank, huge thanks to Todd. I made this point uh, last time, but truly freakish that this guy can play jazz like that. And, and also that he all gets all the tech side. It's, it's kind of amazing. And I, I, Todd, thank you so much for being a, a champion of, of this project uh, and, and for playing Absolutely. music the way you do. Great for all of us. Yeah. Absolutely. 
All right, here we go. Now we'll go back to whispering. Yeah, we're going to go back to whispering. We, we're gonna, yeah, okay. I don't know why, but we do it. <laughs> Ask Mitch. See y'all.